Welcome back now. With 24 days to go until the Brexit deadline, reports emerging this morning are suggesting that armed guard units are to be deployed to the border on a round-the-clock basis to deal with the fallout. The new unit will provide further cover for the existing units that are based in Dundalk and Ballyshannon in County Donegal. Joining us with that story and everything else this morning is Ellen Gunning, Director of the Irish Academy of Public Relations. Good morning, Ellen. Morning, Good Ellen. morning. So we all know if there's any kind of border infrastructure that there will have to be people manning it because otherwise they'll just be taken down and that's just a gateway to all of the problems of the past. So is this, is this in any way surprising, the reports this morning? I think it is slightly surprising because it's another step that the government are taking that brings us closer to the reality that things will change at the end of this month. I thought what was surprising, there were a number of things. The Gardaí have actually identified three different threats, three very clear different threats. One is dissidents. Um, and there's obviously, there's a fear apparently both north and south of the border that dissident activity will increase. The second is criminality, which you could actually expect that if there is no border there, people will take advantage of it. Um, and the third one, I can't remember what it was. It was um, asylum seekers, that there might be more people mm. actually seeking to come into the EU across a, a non-existent border. I suppose the, the surprise of it is that one third of the Gardaí graduating from Templemore this week will actually go to the border regions. So there's a very clear push to arm more Gardaí on the border and to increase the numbers on the border. The Garda approach doesn't seem to be as structured as the PSNI. The PSNI has actually voted an additional budget of something like 20 million to cope, and they've been actively planning for specific new units on the border. The Garda don't seem to have done that, they're just planning to increase the numbers. And the fear that they have, apparently, is that there won't be enough senior Garda with experience pre-border to actually know how to handle things. It's, it's an it interesting works. quandary. Yeah. It's said that the Garda authorities decided last year that a third unit was necessary, but this was all fast-tracked because of the fears for a hard Brexit. And I suppose they have to fast track yeah. it in fairness because nobody actually knows what will happen. Mm. And nobody knows the, the nature the nature of human beings is they will take advantage if there's anything to take advantage of. And the problem from the Gardaí's point of view is that if we're not actually fully protected, if there isn't a good border, mm. even though it's a borderless break in place, we will all complain and say, why didn't they anticipate it? Why didn't they do more? Apparently there was talk about a new unit in Cavan, um, but I'm not sure that that unit is actually being created. Yeah, we're setting ourselves up for a fall, but if, you're, if what Simon is saying is that they were planning these units anyway, mm. and then they're saying we're going to be busier, so it should be double the numbers then, really, shouldn't it? I would have thought it would be a massive increase in the number initially, until things settle. Um, I'm sure they're not going to give us all of the plans that they have in place. They're not going to tell us exactly what the numbers are. They're boosting the numbers, but I would have thought a huge increase initially, until things settle and you develop into some sort of pattern, and you know exactly how it's working. There's something else we were talking about this morning, uh, Ellen, we were asking our viewers to get involved in, was Ireland is to choose between winter or summertime. Now, we've already had a debate, mm -hmm. which you won. I've, I, I've converted, converted I was, I Simon over to, in the to, winter hours, to summertime. Like, I'm going to start at four o'clock. She now likes playing golf in the evening. <laughs> <laughs> it's my only reason. Yeah, so, okay. is, is this possible? What happens if it goes through? It'll, when is it supposed to happen? Apparently, we're supposed to decide. The EU has decided <laughs> that by 2020 or 2022 or something, every country must decide whether they're going to settle on summertime or wintertime. I'm actually a fan of deciding one way or the other, and I don't care which side of the argument yeah. actually wins. Well, it doesn't matter to me. But I know if I'm making a call internationally, um, you always think, well, are they five hours ahead, six hours behind? And it really kills me that you then have to figure out, so did we change? Is that plus one hour for us or minus one hour for us? Mm. So I think it's a great idea that countries would actually be on the same time all the time. But From a business point of view, point, it's smarter. Alan, earlier on, uh, that Britain won't change it because they're no longer going to be in the EU. Mm -hmm. So if we do change, we're going to be different to our nearest neighbours. Why not? And different to Belfast. <laughs> and different to Belfast. <laughs> so you could have now, one time in Dublin and another time in Belfast. Yes, that would be the really interesting one. Yeah, that would be totally crazy, actually. Yeah. But then they have different time zones when you cross the states. I know it is bigger, mm. but you do yeah. cross into different time yeah, zones. I'm sure we'd cope with it. And I'm sure we'd get used to it. But it would be silly. But and also, do you think people would dislike the idea that the EU is telling us to do it? No, I think what the EU... See, the EU hasn't told us which one to decide on. They've just said, will you Pick settle one. on one yeah, or yeah. the other? Yeah. Yeah. Which does actually seem sensible, because I think it makes more sense that every country could say, this is the time zone that we're in. I actually think it would make more sense if the whole of Europe was in one time zone. 
So if it was 7 a.m. everywhere, you know, if we all went summertime or we all went wintertime, but that's but never going to But what is going happen. to work in terms of the EU if, we, if each country votes differently? Are we all going to be in different time zones? Yes, but at least you'll know which time zone you're always in. Oh, so, so you won't, won't be constantly twice trying to figure right. yeah, is, okay. have we changed? So we did this, wow. we, we experimented with it in the late 60s, early 70s. So we, we did do daylight saving time for, that, yeah. for three years. But one of the big things was people didn't like bringing their kids to school in the dark and farmers didn't like getting up in the dark and construction workers didn't like getting up in the dark. So mm. do you think there'll be any protest movements or do you think people will be happy enough just to decide? I think actually the, the brightness in the morning is probably smarter for people like um, children going to school. Um, certainly for people who suffer from seasonal affective disorder, yeah. uh, it would make an awful lot more sense. And I'm a morning bird. So if, if it's shining in the morning, that's fine. But it doesn't particularly bother me. Health and safety, maybe with children in mind, uh, get them to school in the bright, get them home in the bright, is smarter than out in the dark and back in the dark. Mm. Um, one other story we want to look at, and, and quite shocking findings in a, a St Vincent de Paul report, showing that lone working parents, the poverty has jumped. So previously, one in 11 working lone parents was living below the poverty line, and that has jumped in five years to one in five. It's a horrific statistic, isn't it? Mm. It's actually hard to credit. These are parents with children who are working and doing their best to keep a roof over their heads and their mm. children in school and well clothed and whatever, and they're struggling terribly. 60% of those parents, according to that report, could not afford childcare. And 84% said that they had absolutely no reserves to cope with an unexpected crisis. Mm. And an unexpected crisis could be something quite small, not something quite big. It could be a fridge this, going on the blink. It could be anything. It yeah. could, it's a couple yeah. of hundred euros. Or, it's or, renting, a of or rent increases, or which rent is increase, what we yeah, hear yeah. about yeah. all the time. And they're struggling, apparently, with housing, which is no surprise at all. It's an issue that the government really has to tackle. Um, people should be able to afford the simple things. Uh, not the luxuries, but they should be able to afford a roof over their head. They're working parents simple things like childcare, not worrying that you can't afford to bring your child to a doctor or a hospital. That has to be mm. completely wrong. And it sort of made me wonder, there was another report earlier about the fact that the local authorities, the government scheme to allow people to buy their own houses is now being cut back. Apparently they've run out of money. And you think if it was so successful that numbers of people were trying to buy their own homes who wouldn't otherwise qualify, surely something like that scheme needs to be enhanced. I think it's a, a cry to government that yes the rising boat the rising tide is lifting boats but it's not lifting all boats equally and if people are struggling then really the government should find some way of helping them they're doing their best we need to give them some kind of hand up yeah particularly because these are people who are working that's well that's it and when you see stats like you know the data showing that living standards of long parents in Ireland are among the worst in Europe Apparently they have the we're second, second highest only. rate yeah, yeah, to Spain. Of, yeah, out of 15 EU countries. The second highest rates of income poverty, persistent poverty and severe deprivation. And actually the really worrying thing there is persistent poverty. Yeah. That they're working, they're doing their best and no they're getting out. nowhere. Yeah, they're no just, they're, they're travelling mm. around in circles. They're not actually improving their living standards at all. Anyway, thanks for joining us this morning. Alan, this one to really to work on over the next little while. <clears> Thank you. Uh, there's plenty more to come on Ireland AM and we'll be back after this short break.